Um, yeah, so I would ask uh, Ms. Miki Kotanaka, the head of uh, SASO office from SCA, to start uh, this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, welcome everybody, panelists, and uh, also participants here in the room and online as well. So, I'm happy to be back um, to moderate another session today, a very another important issue, which is financing in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. So I'll try to keep it within. We're starting late, but 12 o'clock is the time we're supposed to end. So let's try our best. Uh, we have a distinguished group of panelists here uh, and also online. So I'm just going to ask um, each of them to, uh, you know, give their perspectives. We have different kind of information coming as uh, as presentation of the panels, and then afterwards we can open up for questions or discussions and um, let's see how it goes. So. I'm going to invite my colleague from SCAPS, uh, Macroeconomic Policy and Financing Division, Ms. Sivakudari uh, Sivakumar, the Chief of Finance, of Financing for Development Section. And I'm going to ask her to get five, six minutes to give that intervention. I'll gently <laughs> remind you. Uh, thanks. You know, just to keep the, the timing short, I have a brief presentation. Can I pull that up, Layla? Yes, I think that's for you. Oh, oh and I need the mic. Just to make it more clear. Thank you. Um, so, as Mickey said, my name is Suvasi Kwaran. I'm the section chief for uh, finance and redevelopment at SCAP. Um, and what we do, I'll go through that quickly. Um, and I have a brief presentation here for our climate and nature-based solutions financing in Maldives, which I think connects to the issue of preservation, conservation, and disaster risk management. Um, but I'll, I'll let our other panelists also speak to that quickly. So let me just start with the big picture. Um, there is an assessment of what the gap is that is needed for climate action and SDGs. Uh, by 2030. The amount is in the, the amount of $3 trillion per year. That's what's needed globally for developing countries, doesn't include China. Of this, of the $3 trillion, you can see it divided down. $2 trillion is required from domestic resources. A $1 trillion is required per year uh, in additional external financing commitments, of which $500, uh, $500 billion of private capital is needed. So I guess that sets the perspective that it is not just going to be public sector financing that is required. We cannot just rely on governments to borrow to fund the gaps, but we also need to look at policies and regulations that bring in the right, uh, the right kind of private capital. Um, and then one other thing I would like to mention is that since 2015, the, goal, uh, the goals around climate have been uh, revolving around the Paris Agreement. But in December 2022, which I think uh, everyone here in the Maldives will know because uh, the Maldives has been the leader on this, is that over 190 countries also pledged uh, commitments under the global biodiversity framework. And that looks at the preservation of nature, oceans, uh, biodiversity, and a few other commitments. Under the GBF, there is an additional target of mobilizing $200 billion per year by 2030 for nature and biodiversity. And there is money owed to developing countries uh, from developed countries, which is additional to the $100 billion uh, under the Paris Agreement. So at the moment, we are, we are far from the investment that is needed. So this is an additional gap, a nature financing gap uh, to the climate and SDG gap. I won't go into all of this, but I just want to point out that countries also pledged under the GBF to financing arrangements. So the GBF is not only a declaration around uh, biodiversity targets or preservation of biodiversity or uh, indigenous peoples, it is also a pledge around financing, um, and which means that central banks and ministries of finance in countries will now need to start to think about this. This is very new. Nature-based solutions, I, I think, you know, we know that, but they're actions that basically manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems. So what does this mean for, for the Maldives or for any country? 
it means that we need to develop a sustainable finance ecosystem. And I think UNDP is already uh, being very much a leader on this with their sustainable finance hub. But it's not just a question of reforming your country NDCs, which is on the left, um, your green finance or your green taxonomies. It's also a matter of reforming your financial sector. And it's also very importantly a, a matter of reforming energy, agriculture, water, transport, manufacturing. And as you can see, it's a whole of society transformation on the financial front that is required. So what does ESCAP do, and particularly in the Maldives? Uh, we are beginning a DA15 project. Uh, we have many divisions in ESCAP. I won't go into all of them. But we're supporting four member states, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Maldives, and Samoa, in understanding nature-based solutions, increasing investment in nature-based solutions, and implementing climate smart trade practices. Um, and we're working on technical assistance and promoting sustainable forms of uh, NDS. In addition, we do work on debt for nature swaps, green climate project pipelines, uh, green bond frameworks, and research as well. So we've already looked into this, but my main point here is um, we cannot adopt a project by project approach to raise financing uh, for nature, for climate, for SDGs. We need an integrated approach that both government and banks and private sector are aligned around so that you get the right products and services. But when we look at you know, the barriers to climate and nature-based finance in the Maldives, uh, and this is very similar across many small island states and very similar across developing countries, we see there is a complex climate finance landscape, by which I mean there are many sources of climate finance, whether it's the climate plan, adaptation plans, et cetera. They all have different standards. They all have different you know, regulations and rules. And as a government or as a country, building the capacity to understand all that is challenging. The enabling environment, mm -hmm. by which I particularly mean the private sector environment, is um, not diversified. It's, it's uh, very focused on a couple of sectors, very you know, um, not, not sort of advanced enough to support the mobilization of large amounts of private capital. Short-term project funding, uh, there's a constant kind of recovery mode from disasters, debt constraints, of course, uh, difficulty in aligning with donors, and high investment costs and lack of data as well. So I can circulate this later, and I don't want to go into all of it, um, but I do want to point out that you know, nature-based finance and payment for ecosystem services are a big part of the solution, and there are different aspects of that here. And uh, we have coral, reef, deforestation, mangroves, et cetera, that can look into that. Um, and I know Mikiko's uh, asked me to speed up here. So I will just say that this market on nature-based finance is still new and it's still evolving. And on the private side, I like this quote by an investor in nature-based solutions in a, in a private fund. where he says, I envisage a day where you have traders tracking the performance of a fig wasp and who are able to understand the nuances that that ecosystem and the fig walls can do in terms of pricing and in terms of value. Um, and there's a bunch of revenue and a bunch of uh, carbon and biodiversity credits linked to all of this. It's extra just trying to stay away. So I think I, I have a few more slides around examples, et cetera, um, as well as you know other barriers around what the world will have to do in order to get or financing from this, specifically around safeguards, capacity, land tenure, benefit sharing, and gender impact. But I will stop here for now uh, and then come back to the questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I didn't do justice to the commentary <laughs> that was there, but afterwards, you know, if there is time, you can yeah. get more back to that. So. So I'd like to invite Mr. Mohammed Shahud, uh, economist at UNDP Models. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction and very good to be in sort of part of the panel. I'm not sure whether there is a uh, specific question or maybe you take the for this uh, uh, overall disaster risk reduction in our finance landscape. Just to you know, uh, share some uh, perspectives from the uh, side, how we, how we see this and then also. Very importantly, what are some of the uh, 
challenges that are there for the finance uh, disaster risk reduction involved. So <clears throat> when um, when we look at the overall you know uh, disaster risk reduction legislative and administrative you know, framework uh, in the models, I think there are some very foundational steps which we need to look at uh, to effectively mobilize financing for you know, this the disaster risk reduction and also climate change adaptation and communities. Um, Morovic has you know, the legislative frameworks which defines the roles and responsibilities of operational disaster management authorities uh, in a crisis in management. For example, the National Disaster Management uh, Authorities Act very clearly defines the role of the uh, NDMA, the role of People, state, and how they should be collaborating uh, in a disaster. But uh, the, the current frameworks do not necessarily address you know, how to mobilize financing for disaster. For example, insurance. Uh, the laws do not envision a role for financing this transfer solution in the, in the current laws. And I think there's a gap uh, that needs to be looked at. Uh, it's something that needs to be sort of you know, bridged uh, over the years. You, you know the, the roles and responsibilities of disaster risk management authorities, but you know, not necessarily envisioning uh, a role <clears throat> for uh, you know, risk financing solutions. Um, then the other issue is, I think, from our perspective, <clears throat> the the way that you know. Disaster risk financing is currently seen in the models, and it's typically seen as a budgetary issue. Uh, and you know, I could have maybe a glass of water. I think I have too much for <laughs> this point. Well, it is, but I'll try to continue. Um, <clears throat> so, disaster risk financing and also climate change adaptation is normally typically seen as a budgetary public finance issue in the models. And you know, public financing is a, is a very blunt tool to finance disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Annually, um, we were looking at you know, some of the data from the models, uh, you know, budget allowance allocations are being made. There are small allocations you know, for disaster risk management. Every year, the Ministry of Finance makes an allocation uh, for its moment. Oh, this will be better. Um, every year, the Minister of Finance makes an allocation to finance you know, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in the module budget. Uh, for example, in 2022, uh, there was about 5% allocation from the Ministry of Finance uh, for environmental protection, which also covers you know, the, the, the disaster risk element as well. But uh, this is, of course, a very small allocation. I don't think uh, Suba mentioned in uh, our presentation, no amount of money from public finance will ever be enough to finance you know, environmental conservation and disaster risk reduction. Private sector is to come in and I think insurance has to be a part of it. Going back to the issue, I think treating disaster risk reduction as a public finance issue is something that we need to be, we need to be looking at. We looked at some of the data from the budget uh, dating from 2014 and you know, 2020. And what we saw was that you know, during those seven years, uh, uh, five times you know, the government all spent their allocations to uh, disaster risk reduction. And you know, every time they, they go on a different budget line and then sort of uh, allocate funding, uh, which is a time for you know, other, other programs when a disaster happens. So that's one consequence of you know, uh, creating uh, disaster risk reduction as a public finance issue. I think uh, the role of insurance needs to be looked at um, from the disaster perspective, and and uh, we, we need to know, you know, sort of how insurance can be mainstream in many sectors. Uh, insurance is a market which is you know, growing in Maldives and it's growing, growing quite fast, but there are some sectors in the economy where you don't find insurance products. At all, or uh, you know, at very nascent scales. Fisheries, agriculture, and you know, 
other areas of some of the areas that needs to be looked at, and certainly how we can you know uh, protect uh, public infrastructure assets and public infrastructure, especially critical infrastructure in Maldives. The data suggests that nearly 75% of critical infrastructure in Maldives is within 100 meters of the coastline. So that includes housing, uh, telecom towers, airports, uh, you know, basically resort, resort sector as well, fisheries infrastructure, all these things are, you know, uh, within 100 meters of the coastline, we would expect it because a country like Maldives, uh, it, well, the land is limited, that's how it is. But um, I think we will need to first, you know, sort of understand what are public infrastructure, which are, you know, considered critical, and then also, you know, designate how we can protect them. Uh, and, and, and we don't have, you know, similar registries, you know. Uh, Things which are required to for private sector to come in and consider how that can be ensured. So, two issues on the low, low side, and then also general attitude towards how disaster risk financing is treated in Maldives. My opinion, I will finish with that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, just from the two interventions, you know, this point about the importance of the kind of holistic approach for financing around the R and um, climate. Change adaptation and the fact that the frameworks that do exist in Maldives do not actually take into consideration that financing aspect. So, you know, questions kind of arise why, and probably it's very complex and difficult, but you know, um, really, why doesn't it happen? Why can't it happen? What needs to change? How do you think? I'll leave that kind of hanging there. And I'd like to invite, so, um, I mean, you, Dr. Fazil Naji. Assistant Professor uh, for the Research uh, Development Office in the uh, Maldives National University. Um, Dr. Najib is also a former governor of uh, MMA. So, floor is yours. So, yeah, so I feel quite out of place here <laughs> because. Um, this is my first exposure to anything related to the environment and disaster reduction and climate change. Um, um, but I, I thank the organizers, I thank you also for giving this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, my uh, intervention today is going to be just impressions because I'm totally new. So I would like to learn perhaps from you. But time is really limited. Um, but let me begin with a very short story about SCAP. Uh, I think the fact that SCAP is part of this project is very important for me because um, I've seen um, what SCAP can do. Way back in the 19. 1996 thereabouts, I received a call from one of the SCAP trade advisors saying that he would like to come to Maldives to interview someone. Um, so we got the approval, and uh, the minister at the time was uh, Minister of Trade, Honorable Abdullah Nami, the former president of the Maldives. So this gentleman from, uh, from SCAP, he came down to Maldives and uh, what he was uh, introducing to us was amazing. First, he introduced this to us, to me, myself. And then I was so impressed. Uh, we didn't have any knowledge of this at the time. And so I took him to my minister, and he was really impressed. And so what this gentleman, um, I don't remember his name, is the and um, what he said was, if we use this, we can promote our trade so much and so on. And, and the minister asked, what can be done? And, and he said, uh, Dirag needs to do something and so on. And so Dirag wasn't willing. 
uh, to do this. Uh, but our minister insisted, Virag declined, our minister insisted again, and then Virag hired an American consultant to have a look at this issue. And then he must have um, made recommendations to whatever effect he made. So Mr. Janata left, and then I also had to leave uh, abroad at the time. What followed uh, later was amazing. It so happened that uh, what I think is the consultant would have recommended we see something can be done in the Maldives, and Virag must do it. So therefore, Virag started this. What did they start? The internet. So uh, this was in the 1990s. Uh, they introduced in 1997. So, you know, an organization like ASCAP coming in and being part of this is really encouraging for me. Uh, today, I think internet services is Virag's uh, main revenue stream, I think. Uh, so they were hesitant at the start because they were saying our revenue will go down and so on. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think. Very briefly speaking about the Maldives financial sector and uh, you know, the financing possibilities within the Maldives. My impression, again, it's an impression, is it's going to be really good. Uh, like Shahdu was saying, we view this particular issue as a public finance issue. And all that um, is not within the country that uh, I think typically such such matters it's overseas for this year uh, 2024 the government has allocated a budget of 3.8 billion um, for the for environmental protection generally the larger chunk of the larger capital environment and so that means it's, it's not much it's around say seven percent or so of the total budget but I really doubt if at all anything is coming from the year. And um, we were talking about uh, a trillion that needs to come in of all the developing countries that needs to be raised domestically. Um, I'm very skeptical if even a dollar can be raised <laughs> domestically in terms of hard financing. But of course, there are things that domestically we can do. I was um, in Formula, and that there were people talking about the investment required for uh, installing solar energy systems. And um, for small time businesses, these things are expensive. You know, a uh, one time investment of around 15 to 20,000 rupiah. That's also uh, expensive for them because typically these these companies don't run with a large pool of cash flow. It's really limited. They just get high. Um, so some um, some approach led by the government to facilitate small uh, small businesses to, to do these kinds of uh, investments will I think be useful. I, I agree with uh, also Shah. Um, we talked about losing insurance. Some of the areas in, in the Maldives that are not mandatorily um, required to be insured include fisheries. Fisheries, is in terms of employment, uh, our lives, in terms of domestic employment, our lives sector. There is, there is no requirement for, um, any requirement for uh, uh, insurance in the sector. But if you are financing your investment to a bank, then of course you have, uh, that's not out of a regulation, but banks are not insured if their investment is covered. Um, so I think that's an area where we can seriously look at Again, the, the, this is something new, and not many uh, businessmen will be forthcoming. 
I think there needs to be a lot of education in terms of convincing them of the benefits because the, the general perception in the insurance industry is in, in the business sector is you pay a you pay a premium of you know five thousand rupees per year, nothing happens. And they ask, what the hell did I spend the five thousand for? Sorry for my language. <laughs> but you know they don't they don't uh, realize that they are being covered throughout the year even if nothing happens you know um, so this kind of education I think needs to come in and again this needs to be led by or maybe you know the government or specific sectors. Agriculture is another area. Um, we don't have a lot of agriculture uh, in terms of contributions to GDP. Um, a publication for different years is for uh, sectors. Consistently, agriculture is at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's a very, very insecure uh, sector. Um, but I think. Um, attending to uh, insurance in this way will also help to uh, increase the contribution of the insurance sector. The, the small matter of diversification in the Maldives is, I think, uh, really uh, well established. We've been talking about economic diversification for a very long time, but we haven't been able to do so. It's encouraging that in recent years there has been some talk about introducing other sectors, um, diversified economies. And currently there is an ongoing, um, ongoing project to introduce international financial services. That's well and good. But to diversify. I don't want to cut your trail of thought. It's really interesting. I just need to allow other people. Okay, to... yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take one minute. I'll, I'll take one minute. I think to diversify the economy is not um, necessary. It's not necessary to introduce new sectors, but it is good if you can. But increase the contribution of other sectors. Just one example in 2020, all other sectors were stagnant. Financial sector was still. Performing because you know these, these things such as perform, they, they they did something, but the contribution of financial sector to the economy jumped to around 11, 11 percent in 2020, 2021. So that's that that kind of information I think is there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut you off. It's really right. interesting. And uh, Najib, you started off saying you don't know why you're here or you don't fit in, but certainly you found your role here. And uh, thanks for sharing that first experience because I think um, it is around about a kind of a paradigm shift, right? And then it's kind of insight and inspiration, a little bit of push. I think we don't need the American consultant anymore, sorry. No. <laughs> but you can probably do that. <laughs> Let me invite now, um, I think we go online now, Mr. Alper Aras, who is the Economic Affairs Officer of uh, UNTR. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me on this meeting. Uh, in the region, we are mainly uh, focused on to prepare, uh, to support the Minister of Finance in preparing disaster risk reduction financing strategy. Uh, Normally, as you know, that uh, there are many uh, disaster risk financing strategies that the countries prepare in the region. But when we look at this disaster risk financing strategy, we show that uh, mainly the disaster risk financing strategy focus on the response activities uh, of the countries. But on the other hand, uh, if you don't invest in preventing uh, naval risk or risk reduction of disaster, uh, the response, the cost of the response uh, for disaster uh, should increase in every country in the region. And also, uh, there is also cost for risk financing uh, instruments for the response for disaster. Uh, in this regard, uh, and also when we review the disaster risk financing strategy, we saw that uh, the risk financing 
uh, strategy uh, contributed uh, the structure of how to uh, finance the response activities. But on the other hand, we couldn't see very structured uh, approach or methodology how to finance the disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation uh, investment. Uh, and from our experience, I can say that the first step to prepare uh, the financing strategy for disaster risk reduction and climate uh, change adaptation investment is to determine uh, the cost of uh, the cost of the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation needs of the country. And most of this uh, cost uh, determination uh, is made in the national adaptation plan of countries. For example, when I look at the national adaptation plan of Bangladesh, their need uh, is approximately $230 billion until uh, 27 years. And every year, Bangladesh should spend $8.5 billion for disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation investment. On the other hand, when I look at the uh, Nepal, their need is approximately 600 uh, million uh, for early warning uh, for all initiatives. But the, the other side of this story is that when, uh, when I look at the fiscal space of the countries, their fiscal space is too limited. And now many countries in the region face some macroeconomic uh, problems. Uh, for example, some of this uh, foreign exchange reserve is decreasing uh, and also uh, they don't, on the other hand, when, for example, when we review their the funding cap for the responding activities, there is also huge funding cap. In this regard, uh, I think that in the, if the countries, uh, if the country is resilient for the disaster, they should set aside, they should have enough resources for both responses and the disaster risk reduction at the same time. And they need a huge amount of money. Then this area is, and I think that the economy is interested in this area because we have very limited resources, but the demands is very huge. Then what can we do? I think that the most priority for the Minister of Finance to deal with this situation is to have some tools uh, to quantify the prioritize uh, the disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation investment. But this prioritization should be based on uh, the quantification of the cost and the benefit. But uh, when I look at the, uh, these prioritization tools, I saw that uh, most of the countries use multi-criteria uh, analysis. In the multi-criteria analysis, the countries determine seven or eight criteria, and then based on this criteria, they prepare a survey, and this survey is sent uh, to the experts, and based on this, they determine to prioritize their DRR and climate change adaptation investment but it is too subjective. Uh, for this reason, I think that it is, uh, and al also when I when we speak with the uh, staff of the Minister of Finance, we saw that uh, they, for example, they say that we don't have any tools uh, how to allocate our resources to most cost effective DRR and climate change adaptation investment. For this reason, we allocate our sources based on the, uh, the power of the other ministries. And this situation should be changed immediately. And I think that it is most appropriate way is to establish a methodology or tools uh, for the co to quantify the cost and the benefits of climate change adaptation and the disaster risk, uh, reduction investment. Uh, when we consider uh, too narrow fiscal space of the country have. The second issue is that the Minister of Finance also doesn't, uh, aren't ready for any disaster that will happen in the future. Uh, they don't know, for example, how to act when the disaster hit the country, how they construct the fiscal and fiscal uh, policy. For the central bank uh, respective, also, the central bank doesn't have a tools how to construct or change 
the current monetary policy when the disaster hit their countries. In this regard, I think that uh, the Minister of Finance should construct the macroeconomic models uh, that shows the possible impact of the disaster on the macroeconomic indicators and the fiscal indicators of the country. And by doing this, uh, under the several scenarios, uh, they can construct a several fiscal policies uh, in advance of the disaster occurs. And this uh, makes the Minister of Finance prepare in advance before the disaster. Uh, and after that, yes. Can I go? Uh, okay, okay. And uh, I, uh, in, the, in the summary, I try to say that I think that for the uh, financing for the disaster risk reduction, respective, uh, the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank in the region uh, don't have appropriate forward looking tools uh, to analyze the impacts of the disaster. And also, uh, they don't have a uh, looking forward tools to make prepare them to risk informed decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off again, but uh, just to continue the discussion. I heard a lot of tools, tools, tools. Yes. So what tools work? What tools are what are what is addressable with tools? What is not? Maybe that's also a key question to probe it. Thank you. I'd like to invite Mr. Mohammed Bashir, who is the president of the Nobu Council. Uh, just like uh, Basil, I have uh, basically a few stories actually in my experience. I think I have to share my experience as a counselor. So I will try to go from that perspective. Back in, uh, we were elected back in 2021, our town started, and we really had uh, something. Related to metabase in our, our development plans, we composed uh, with the mainstream actually uh, the, the whole thing into metabase solution in terms of waste management, uh, shoulder in protection, and any municipal uh, projects or municipal service that we are to provide, and any budget that we could allocate. So, upon that. Uh, at all council, it had some incentives that we could provide and some finance and everything. It's very little to, uh, to, uh, to the island councils to encourage them to adopt uh, nature based solutions. So, when we started working on it and it had uh, uh, some of the consultants at, at also, we developed a framework where we provide incentives based on their practices and the progress in terms of waste management work. For in terms of waste management, we, we, we do the framework where in islands where there is no segregation, we are not providing collection services or pickup services. So first they have to have uh, workshops, awareness for segregation. So such a kind of framework was developed and passed by the adult council. <laughs> what happened was no island councils were ready or to capture this funds, this incense, because they they wanted to have, it to happen so quickly. So they have a back door where they could go around to the middleman, which is the MPs, and the MPs would go to the minister and grab the financing. Where well, ministries doesn't have such a kind of friend. So I have seen the sustainable something something framework. Is it something happening now or in more So if, if such a kind of a framework is institutionalized in more, of course, this will change and be huge time. But uh, I don't see it happening for, because. Uh, our framework was presented to the World Bank, who is the main financer for uh, investment. They approved it. 
Uh, we met with the environment ministry in the meetings there through the office. We communicated with officially, uh, but the acknowledging that this friend that they will finance through this framework to the monetary council, the Alien council is not. We did, we did it. That's one, one of the other, other thing that which happened was in Dubai. Some, some of you might know they have developed uh, a shoreline protection uh, project on their land use mapping as well, on a nature bed uh, solution with, with, with uh, various consultants. Also there. But at, at the end of the day, uh, the the ministry didn't approve of their nature based designs. It was much cheaper, and of course, it is new. So, the ministry didn't approve of the designs and they wrote. So, they kept on delaying financing. It was already on the budget, and the, the, the island, the budget, the island required was much more, uh, much more low. But uh, the, the, the public pressure is there. Because they want the project, and so the island council left the plan and gave it to the, the MPCC. <laughs> and the other thing that happened was we developed a framework where uh, for the new building, new infrastructure, especially public offices, to be built in. Islands, we propose the government to have it in a multi purpose building that we will allocate a, 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 a single plan for all the buildings where the, the, the island office, council secretary, uh, the tenant office, which of course we don't need, um, the courts, everything should be on under one. We propose the solution. We approach the present actually, and they also have a, have the same plan. But the answer was that this will not happen because there is a lot of uh, the MP need projects, right? so it should be different. Okay. So again, the, the the need for the framework comes uh, here. The importance of it. The, those were some. Experiences we will be had best in the past two years. And what I wanted to share. I think uh, the, the sustainable finance and framework is something very important. It could be it, it, it could be institutionalized or uh, it could be made a law or something. Uh, of course, uh, on metal council levels, island council levels, this could be a regulation or second procedural thing. But Something needs to be adopted in the central budgeting finance. And the other thing is the, the middleman politics is encouraging that I want to. I, I like entities to get involved, but if there's a framework where central government can finance on the how on anything that can be would like to have. Making it a more, more construction projects to happen might be something that they can like. So, there are a lot of work done in that. So, if there is a framework, I think this, this will be a success story. It could lead to and more transparency. Great. No, thank you very much for sharing that local experience. I think is really, really, really important because it's that's where the rubber hits the road, and particularly in the case of disaster risk reduction and our adaptation, that's where really, really the action and the results need to be there. I think it's a kind of a, a lot of lessons in there as to even for development actors, uh, government as well, and changing government, politicians, all of that. But um, this framework seems, you know, like kind of a magic solution, but, you know, it's very messy. And, you know, the balance between what you actually harmonize, have standardized, really systemized, and the part that's kind of, you know, needs that flexibility, right, to actually allow for local actors to do what they need to do on the ground, right? So, a lot of lessons. Thank you very much. Uh,
Um, so uh, last but not least, I'd like to invite Mr. Tikian Ibrahim, who is the Assistant Director at the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think we've had a lot of great insights so far. I wanted to focus in a bit more on climate change adaptation, because obviously the Ministry of Climate Change, Environment and Energy, we are well and native with overall climate policy when it comes to integration of finance and adaptation. Um, well, climate change adaptation, often it is the case that we, as a developing country, as a small island government state, we do want to try and um, sort of access the different international allocation and international funds that there are, especially given that with the climate crisis, it's something we have a negligible contribution to. Um, so we do want to see international support coming flowing through to the more views. Um, but that's not often the case when we see that level of support that we want internationally coming into the country. Um, and many of many times adaptation projects are funded domestically. Um, so we do have domestic resources, but obviously there are constraints and we don't have an infinite resource pool um, to access. But uh, very often we have to reallocate resources when we have um, different uh, climate or weather events and um, I know the colleagues from the National Disaster Management Authority who are very actively involved in the response um, factor. But these are things that often um, take up a big part of our domestic budget. Speaking into international um, climate finance, especially towards adaptation, I wanted to highlight the UNEP Adaptation Gap Report, which was released last year. Um, and it says that the adaptation finance needs of developing countries amount to 300 and 87 billion US dollars a year until 2030. Um, this, as some people might be aware, that developed countries didn't pledge to double their um, adaptation finance um, levels. Um, but the UNEP GAP report found out that even if they doubled those levels of support that they provide, only 10% of the current gap would be covered, which is a significant amount. Um, and the reason I talk about um, international finance. So much because that's sort of uh, what we try to do in the ministry when we have different projects that we try to um, formulate. You know, we had a project with the MVP that we funded to the Green Climate Fund you know, project currently ongoing with JICA. Um, and we're very dependent on accredited entities. Um, we like to be more, I guess, nationally reliant to um, develop our national um, institutions to sort of consistently fund them. There are many challenges, and I think this is the case for many small island developing states as well across the world. The difference, I think, between Maldives and other states is that we aren't part of the major regional groups. Um, so you have the Caribbean, you have the Pacific. So not every single Caribbean or Pacific country has national institutions that are great, that they have regional institutions that they can access. Um, and I think that's very, very, very different um, as an Asian country, as a South Asian country. There are no other small island open states in South Asia. There are other island, um, small island open states in the Indian Ocean, but they are Caribbean states like seashells, Mauritius, and Ross. Um, and it's not often easy to then um, partner with them on things. Uh, I think with the international lot of financial architecture, we, like many other cities, we call for global reforms because um, it's not working for us. It's not, it's, when we apply for a project, it takes around three or more years for the project to be approved. And by then, the reality of the firm is so much more different than we initially applied. Um, and often the resources that we do get are sufficient uh, to actually make as big of a difference as we initially thought we would be able to, to, to make. Um, and I think with the international architecture, it does need to account for smaller economies. There are many developing countries that it's relevant to what, what's happening and the things that are having to propose the innovative solutions. Um, but I think very often when these are proposed with a more different context, um, and these are based on discussions we've had with the finance as well, we need to know what's appropriate and what would work. Uh, our markets are quite small, our economy is small. Um, so that every single tool that proposed, can these work here? Would they be successful? Would they be feasible? So I think that's something that's been a big hindrance in pursuing some of the more 
innovative things. And also we've had um, feedback that uh, we received from uh, other smaller developing states, for example, in things like debt financial swaps. There are states who have had not so great experiences with debt financial swaps. Um, and it's trying to learn from other states who have taken these things and maybe not had, maybe had very successful endeavors, also maybe not have received the, the expectations. Um, so then I think what you said about the landscape being messy, it is very messy, um, but it's trying to find out what works. And I think the challenge is that that takes time, um, especially when you're trying to develop an institution in the terms of this within our current institution. Um, and that's something that we're still trying to do. Um, I wish it could happen overnight, but often the case. Um, but yeah, it's something that's obviously a priority. We it's just have a change in effects our daily life. Um, I'm showing we were probably here yesterday when it rained very, very heavily um, after a few days of sun. Um, but we have to be we still have to travel to Ireland. We still have to uh, conduct activities for uh, remote purposes. Life doesn't stop a week after that. Um, and I think that's that's the challenge. Thank you very much. Where there is a way, there is a will. Um, so I'm going to open the floor for maybe one or two questions or contributions. But um, in closing, I'm going to ask every, every panelist maybe a question of what is one new insight you gained out of like listening to everybody and what you want to raise today? So we leave that thought with you. Any questions or contributions offline or um, yes, please? Uh, maybe we need a microphone. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you uh, for uh, all the panelists. I'm Lafa uh, from MVP. My question is uh, thank you so much. Uh, we talked about uh, the importance of unlocking private capital. Uh, we all know the why, but could you talk a bit on the how, especially uh, from the perspective of the UN and development system as well as the public sector? Because uh, these sectors often, uh, when you say, Private or bad, but so how do we find a way of working together? We'll take the questions first and then we'll come back. Yes, in the back later. Hello, yes, from Wallace Space Research Organization, and of course, it's a specific question. In the National Adaptation uh, Plan, uh, I, I I thought that there's a pretty comprehensive uh, project coming up or an initiative coming up. Uh, is this sector something that is uh, looked at at all? Space as a sector, space as an ecosystem, or economic activity? Is it looked at at all? Um, there was a mention uh, in the previous panel where uh, slow onset uh, disasters and um, events like tsunamis once in every hundred years, they really impact the current economic uh, landscape. So what other extremely resilient uh, economic activities are being looked at? Thank you. Are you online? No. Okay. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to hand back maybe in the reverse order of the panelists. So please answer the questions. Anything you'd like to add, but please also uh, one new insight that uh, we got out of this panel. So starting from you. Um, so first on um, the question about the national adaptation plan. So it's still in a very early stage of big problem. It's you know, still pending a lot of work as to how it's going to be formulated. Uh, I have not sure today right now because uh, we have to have a session meeting about it. Um, but I, I'm, I think historically when we've looked at our key sectors, we don't necessarily consider space as a sector, but rather we try um, especially given that the Moses Mutual Action Service falls under the ministry, uh, the Minister of uh, Climate Change and Environmental Energy, developing our capacity um, for the access to data to monitor um, different changes to our islands, to our reefs. These are priorities, um, and these are things that we need to do. Um, so I think. If anything, it might fall into something regarding observations, uh, imagery, but I don't know if space itself, as you stated, in the future, how, how 
Um, I think just to go into the, I guess, uh, reflection, um, there was lots of insight. And I think my my main takeaway is what Bashir mentioned. I think we definitely have to focus more in on how to engage the council level um, involvement in these processes uh, and how we can ensure that things that we develop are accessible to, to the people on the ground who are the council. Great, thank you. Yeah, if the frameworks are not being amended or uh, reformed, I don't, I don't see any reason to buy them. Uh, mostly, all the development projects are uh, going against DRR or environment implementation. This is a general the finance, uh, lots of uh, waste management projects also going against the design, uh, almost. Opposite of uh, the major brand project. Uh, this accelerate uh, project, uh, harbor project, it's not getting there in the I don't see it. <laughs> really, um, if there is no change in the design frameworks, the collaboration, and the boundaries, financial transparency of this sustainable uh, finance framework, if these things is not happening, I don't see any reason. The national voice daily on this Great, thank you. Well, thank you. Mr. Aras. Uh, for the macroeconomic question, uh, to answer this question, first of all, uh, I can give a small uh, description how the macroeconomic models work. Uh, there are normally two macroeconomic models uh, that is made by the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF models is called the DICNAT, and the World Bank uh, models is more focused on the infrastructure, the impact that shows the impacts of the disaster on the infrastructure. But uh, the loopholes of this model is that uh, we should have a shock, uh, and this shock uh, should be given to the models. Because if this shock is small, then these models doesn't work. Uh, because the macroeconomic models that describe the whole economy of the country. Uh, for this reason, for example, the slow onset uh, disaster doesn't have a huge shock. Uh, for this reason, I think that uh, we should find or construct another macroeconomic models. Also, for example, in Bangladesh or in other countries or small island countries, we face uh, the intensity also, the intensity, the intensity of the disaster is too low, but the frequency is too much. But the models doesn't work also in this situation. The models only work, the intensity and the frequency is too high. Uh, one of the loopholes of this model is that, but these models all show us that when the disaster hit in a country, did uh, this damage the uh, public, uh, the public and the private capital and the human capital. And in the long term, this causes uh, the productivity capacity of the country. And for this reason, it impacts the long term growth rate of the country very much. Uh, for this reason, it is very important when the disaster hit a country, the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank should follow uh, very appropriate fiscal and the monetary policy to reduce the impacts of the disaster on the public, private, and the human capital. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, Dr. Najib. Uh, thank you. Um, so, I think for me, a big question um, coming out. Although not in exactly the same words, is um, one size does not fit. Um, I think uh, you know the international architecture that's been developed to address these issues should be customized to suit the local needs. Yeah, for example, for in the again, um, in the Maldives, we had a, an international consultant that he came and he said. There is no potential for development of tourism in the Maldives. You know, and he was he was right uh, because he looked at what was available. He forgot to look at what the potential. So I, I think the, the local um, conditions are really important. I wish we had this these sessions on a typical local island where 
you would have first hand to see how vulnerable you are. <laughs> and let me take back the message. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Chabon. Uh, thank you so much for the example. Just in conclusion, I think there are a couple of uh, relevant things for all of us. And one of the things is when we uh, develop and the person pops in other places, we have pledged a lot of money for the time of science and a billion goes for this. It is the last for additional funding for the loss of damage fund goes for this. They are, of course, slow in coming. And it's a question for it's a very weird question, a uh, peculiar question for all the United States. And so, what do we do? Uh, should we wait for these funds to come, or is there something that we need to say? You know, so, should we do? One thing that you know we we became aware of, and this is something that is happening globally, is that actually you know the financial architecture is now trying to actually uh, integrate climate. Question is something that we have to need to think about. We need to see, you know, what are those daily steps that we can do as a country uh, you know, to address some of these challenges. Um, climate change adaptation, mitigation, and disasters reduction in the form of the ESG score was integrated into our own credit uh, rating, which was published by Moody's and Fitch uh, last time. And it's meant to reward the things uh, that the country does to address and mitigate. And like Vivian and I think all the colleagues mentioned, we don't have uh, you know the fiscal capacity to integrate you know, something like that. But there are those you know maybe things like mainstreaming of insurance, as Katrina and Deep also mentioned, some things that we can do in that right direction. I don't think we will have. Uh, you know, access to the kind of funding that we will require to address disaster reduction and climate change adaptation. Last year, when we did some work with the Ministry of Finance, we estimated that you know, all this may require something to the tune of 800 to 1.4 billion dollars in adaptation and mitigation finance per year until 2030. That is a lot of money that we don't have access to. So, then we need to, and, and and the fact that the Maldives is now an upper middle income country, which is migrating towards a developed country uh, in five years, makes things a bit difficult for us because typically donors look for least developed countries to allocate finance. So we had a really disadvantaged position. I think the, pro the, the allocation of grants will continue to decline. And that's the same reality. Although we are one of the most you know, climatically Vulnerable countries on earth. That financing depends on the amount of you know, donor financing that is available, which is not coming at the speed that we require. Disaster risk financing requires access to quick uh, financing. You can't wait, like uh, Ibian mentioned, for two to three years for that. A much more efficient form of risk financing, which is more appropriate to disaster financing, is required. And in my opinion, that's, that's insurance. There are some ways that you know sits in the Pacific, like Vivian mentioned, has organized themselves. It's home to you know some of the risk uh, catastrophe risk insurance mechanism. There are two such mechanisms in the Pacific Island of shared between 14 countries. There, there is a similar model for South Asia, more it's not part of it, it's, uh, it's under ASEAN. But there are these regional mechanisms which are being set up, which is designed to address disaster not to two to three years, but the moment that a disaster is you know, triggered, uh, if you're part of such a mechanism, uh, you get access to quick relief funds. I think that's something that we need to work on. So with that, I will conclude. Great, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, speaking to the question that was raised in the panel's uh, insight, one thing is that what we're seeing across the world, whether it's for climate financing or nature-based financing, which is a form of climate change adaptation, nature-based financing, shoreline protection, mangrove protection, ocean protection, this is a form of uh, adaptation. These require long-term approaches. Um, and for 
financing for any country, you will have private commercial capital that you need to bring in, which is based on your country's regulations and policies. You will have climate funds, such as the Green Climate Fund or Adaptation Fund, which may take two to three years to um, access, but they're also one source of financing along with the private commercial financing. You have local capital markets, you have pension funds, you have people like you and me investing in your own country's capital market. Uh, and then you have official development expenditure and your public expenditure. So this cannot be looked at in isolation. And I think what the gentleman from the Asshole Council was speaking about is that frequently when we look at private finance and public finance, our markets have always prioritized return uh, and they have uh, quantified risk in very narrow ways. That is changing now. The, the markets are starting to understand that they need to quantify nature risk, they need to quantify climate risk, and that payment for eco, ecosystem services do need to go down to the communities um, who have been left out of these financing approaches. I guess there's no easy answer, but long-term financing approaches that are consistent, that you know cascade down from federal to subnational level, and are integrated with the international financial architecture is needed because it's going to require all sources of finance to be not just right. okay no thank you very much for that very insightful obviously we're not going to solve the problems here yeah. but i think it's like i think the way and it's not that new really but um you know talking about the power your power by depending on someone to come with a solution or come with the money, I think equally important is what you do with what you have already. And you're already probably doing a lot already. But then in that, you know, what what is important for you? And again, ask questions, you know, and uh, obviously the other side needs to listen as well to the local, you know, councils where whatever the you know configuration is, the more you can kind of gather your thoughts together and you know come up with kind of a these are common issues for us i mean that kind of increases the bargaining power too right and there are more people you know people will listen and there are more people saying it as well so i mean you know it's not rocket science but uh it is a whole creative process and frameworks are not going to be the, the solution i mean it's not the first day we talk about frameworks it's been around as a concept a long time but how do you create the uh, framework that's co-creation, and it's very different from place to place, wherever the needs are. But thank you so much. I've uh, passed it, uh, the time a little bit. Uh, we like to thank the panelists online, um, Mr. Aras, and also the panelists here in the room. I think it was a really, really uh, interesting uh, discussion. So, next up.